Well, you're tuned into the Barry and Joe show here on the radio back once again. And Joe, I'm excited because a guy like me, very difficult to find the music we're about to experience here. Let's get into it. It's Azim and it's Azima Lee and Loga from Niaz. Did I get all that wrong? Yes. All of it. You got <laughs> Niaz. You got it's Azam Ali. Azam Ali. Azam. Azam. Come on, Barry. Azam Ali and Loga from Niaz. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Okay, now, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to apologize again for our pronunciation. Yeah, that's so we're going to we're going to we're going to try. We're trying. We're just trying. <laughs> All right. Go, go ahead. Barry. <laughs> well, OK, we're going to talk about your uh, show coming to UCLA's Royce Hall, August 19th. It's the fourth light, an immersive multimedia experience. Now, in my first look at what you guys are doing over there, I immediately said to myself, this is a Vegas show. This is uh, something that's going to win a bunch of awards. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? The fashion, the drums, the, it's an experience. So first off, thank you guys so much for making something like this. And uh, was it difficult? Like, let's go back to the beginning. How do you all know each other? Uh, well, we've kind of grown up together. I moved to the U.S. Um, in 1985 from India, actually. And Loga also came here after the Iranian Revolution uh, when he was a teenager. So we met. Uh, actually, I met Loga when I was 18 years old. And there was a really thriving uh, music scene here in Los Angeles where a lot of sort of global music artists were looking to kind of create new sounds and mm -hmm. Um, you know, so it was a very uh, exciting and exciting time musically, a lot of experimentation going on. And Loga actually had another band called Axiom of Choice. I started another band called Voss with an American percussionist. And they both ended up becoming very successful projects. And those had a good run for uh, for about four albums, each band. And then we decided oh, to wow. dissolve those projects and... Uh, do something together and at that point we just didn't want to repeat what we had already done and you know I had a huge interest in electronic music so Loga decided uh, you know we decided let's create something um, that's truly a hybrid of acoustic and electronic music and it was kind of you know what you said before you started recording it's hard for you to find music you like and I think a big part of why we created Niaz was because it was music we were craving to listen to and it, nothing really existed like that um, for Iranian, mostly Iranian music. And um, and that's kind of how it started. We started as a regular band and then uh, we moved to Montreal and there we developed a huge interest in, in sort of uh, what we call a digital sonography, this kind of immersive experience using uh, technology to enhance live performances. So then we met uh, an amazing visual artist there, a French visual artist, Jérôme de Lapierre, and he designed this show for us. So it's really um, fast forward all these years. This is sort of the direction we're moving more and more. It's uh, it's really a synthesis of dance, music, a live music show, and visuals, uh, a lot of the visuals are sound reactive. It's responding to sound and movement in real time. So it's kind of bringing all the different art mediums to create one experience. Yeah, and it is an experience. I haven't even seen it yet, but from what you're saying. So, OK, so you were in bands, L.A. bands before, right? <laughs> yes. <And then>, you <laughs> like. This is uh, we're going to take a left turn here and follow our dreams because this isn't going where we want it to go. And then. So what kind of bands were you in before? Like, what was your scene like? There was, you said there was a big music scene. Tell me about that. Well, then during during those uh, early 90s, you know, there were a couple of really cool clubs in L.A. Luna Park was one of them. Capital. Mm. There were uh, Genghis Khan. These places were kind of clubs that were supporting or giving their platform to world music artists to kind of mm -hmm. bring fusion music onto small stages. 
And there we were just, you know, where we were just experimenting, learning, doing things together. And, uh, you know, we were both as and I were fortunate that uh, our projects got signed to Norada, which is no longer around. But at the time, Norada was a kind of a, a force. A yeah, yeah, there was a force in the, it, it was a label that, that, you know, had a had a repu good reputation for presenting uh, world music artists. So from there, then therefore our career kind of uh, with those two respective bands kind of rose and we, you know, had a good run with them. Yeah, but we're also talking about the 90s. So it was really before the collapse of the music industry. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we were able to, I mean, honestly, I think if we launch Niaz today, it, it, we there's no way we would be successful because um it's it's just a very different it's first of all you the market is so overly saturated that then you don't have you know during those times there was still so much radio airplay there was so much um I mean, you know i don't need to tell yeah, you our record oh, yeah yeah you yeah. know we used to do in-store <laughs> record store like performances and you know we started like it was all grassroots so a lot of the Bands that we built that who who followed us into Niaz really are bands that are as an audience that we initially cultivated, um, you know, with our original bands. So it was, it was, it was a. We were very fortunate that we we started our career right before the collapse. You know. Yeah. Uh, no. Absolutely. Music discovery these days is really really hard because, like you said. Um, everything's really fractured. It's not like you can go to one place and and find something that you're looking for. You gotta go Spotify to YouTube, to this, to that, over on TikTok. And and, and nothing is, is, is driving people to like that kind of world music anymore. I think yeah. it's all, it, it's all, it's all gone like really poppy. And so like finding something like your multimedia experience is, is refreshing. Watching that video of your performance from Montreal that you have on your website is fascinating because you don't see a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, actually, this multimedia show is uh, very unique in its nature because, uh, you know, the technology did exist, but people were not really uh, adapting it to performing art uh, stages. And that was what the challenge uh, we decided to take on and kind of adapt that technology and be able to create a performance that we can, you know, you don't need an arena to kind of implement. We actually could do it in performing our theaters, which generally there are between like 600 seaters to 1200, you know, capacity. Okay. Yeah, but it's like you said, like it's, a, you know, you would look at it and say, wow, it's a, like a Vegas show, but you know, the thing is, we wanted to do something that was small and also affordable for everybody, you know, so that everyone could have access to the experience and that your tickets are not like two hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> right, right. Like we were talking about before, it's it's nice that you're going to Royce Hall and we don't need to pay Ticketmaster or Live Nation nine hundred dollars in surcharges to go see you guys. <laughs> it's an actually it's an actually uh, a, like a reasonably priced show that gets you a lot it's because it's not just music it's the the cultural immersion in the iranian american experience that i think is going to open up that culture for a lot of people myself included i was not very familiar with a lot of the dance or the fashion or the 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 sounds that you are creating in this experience and that was that was really eye opening for me that's wonderful. That makes me very happy. So it's you, you're learning something about people who live among you. <laughs> it, no, exactly. Well, <laughs> come on. We're all we're all remote workers now. We're all just stuck in our apartments, working <laughs> on our computers. How it's 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 nice to go out and see people every now and then and get exposed to new things. So this is great. This is a, a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, and the Iranians, you know, the largest uh, expatriate community of Iranians live in Southern California. So you probably have an Iranian neighbor. <laughs> oh, no, uh, no, I absolutely, I absolutely do. I have, um, I have an Iranian neighbor. I have Armenian neighbors. Um, <laughs> and I, oh, and I actually have a neighbor from Georgia, from the country of Georgia. So, yes, I, I it is great. I, I, I enjoy learning about new cultures. And so this is something that really uh, is in my wheelhouse. 
Well, That's yeah. Great. And let me ask you though, what is your, uh, what does your audience look like? Cause you know, it, uh, are you, uh, seeing a lot of different kinds of people in the audience now that are out for, you know, uh, a different kind of experience or what, tell me about your fan base. Actually, uh, you know, just coming from our respective bands, uh, so so my background, even though I ended up, you know, becoming popular for my world music stuff. Um, so I, my background is, I, I was a full on post punk goth girl. So I grew up with yes. a, I grew up with a lot of like the sort of, you know, when I moved here from India, I got into a lot of the sort of, you know, the industrial music that was coming out of Chicago, like Wax Tracks Records. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Mm-hmm. And then there was like 4AD, you know, totally opposite side. So a lot of Cocteau Twins, Dead Can Dance, the, you know, all of, you know, so Joy Division, all that was all like my Ah, uh, yes. You gays are in among then, us here. And, you know, one <laughs> of the things about that, that whole music scene is that they incorporated a lot of world music uh, elements in their music, whether it's instruments or... And it spoke to me because a lot of the sort of uh, minor keys, the the melancholic aspect of of that music. So it kind of resonated with me, even culturally, even though it didn't, uh, you know, sonically, it was very different. So that was sort of my background. And somehow that kind of leaked over into even my own music. And I found that people who came from those music backgrounds, they've always been very open to uh it's a sort of world music and you know these the you know you, we probably owe a lot of that to bands like dead can dance mm-hmm. how 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 hard is it for you to to marry those things the the digital aspect of music creation and sound design with analog instruments and and instrument you know instruments that are hundreds of years old that are that are still played in uh iranian music how how did you find that difficult? Was it interesting? Because you found um, a, a synthesis there that I, I don't really hear in other places. At the beginning, it was. I mean, we, at the beginning, it was just really experimenting and learning as we go along. Uh, and it took a while to really kind of hone it down, really be able to understand exactly how we're going to get this done properly. But uh, yeah, I mean that was that was really conscious. We were we didn't just want to create a bunch of bits and then go on top of it, improvise and kind of slap this sound and that and just just be done with it. We wanted to kind of make sure that it merges. We did a lot of sound design, manipulation of the instruments, mani- manipulation of the voice, and then once you've done that in the studio, now you have to bring it on stage. So now you had a new challenge. Or how do we do this on stage? And it mm-hmm. took it quite a while to kind of get it down so that we can do both properly and have a you know have an emotional p- impact upon our audiences. Okay, who's more of the tech nerd of you two? Which one is the one? That is- <laughs> She's like Logan. Um, <laughs> as, I guess as much as an amazing no. producer as she just <laughs> and, and you know I I. It, all uh, disclaimers aside, I, I was, I was for for many years, I was that singer that I would just come into the studio and I would just sing and do my part or help write the song, and then you know one day Loga sat me down and he was like, you know, we were, uh, I was pregnant with my with our son, and he said, look, those days of like you, me recording you are, are gonna change because once that kid comes, you know, we're gonna have to. You know, the you're gonna have to learn how to record yourself. So he gave me a crash course in engineering, and then from there, I just developed a huge interest in the in technology. And then I started learning and learning and learning. And now, you know, thankfully, I'm, uh, you know, I'm good at production. I can do A to Z on my own. But definitely, if I have technical issues, Loga is my technical yeah, support. Yeah, I'm the technical support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so. Because of the tech stuff, and we're getting a lot of new technology with AI. Have you guys been experimenting with that at all? How do you think that might change your own sound? You know, actually, it's interesting you bringing this up because it came up in another discussion that we were having a few days ago. 
you have to look at any sort of this kind of a revolution or huge technological shift in order to understand it. You have to kind of take a previous model and see how did it change things around. So the last time that we had something this big happening was when the actual recording technology came about. And many, you know, before then, if you wanted to experience music, you had to have live musicians in the room. You mm-hmm. could separate the two. So when that, you know, recording was coming, people thought, oh my God, I'm going to be unemployed. Musicians thought that I'm going to be replaced by a machine. But that was not the case. It became an, a tool and it shifted the cultural value of artists, no doubt. But Artist remained and it became another tool. I look at the AI the same. Nobody knows exactly how it's going to play out. But one thing I can tell you, musicians are going to stay and somehow they're going to find a way to utilize this new technology to enhance themselves. Now, it changes the cultural value of the art because, uh, you know, that before, you know, you had to pay for a musician to, to either be part of your family, educated so that they can do music or hire somebody. So that, you know, the, the recording technology changed its value. The same thing is going to happen to uh, with AI. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we haven't experimented with it yet. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't even know where to start, but it doesn't terrify me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe if I had different jobs, if I was a, it was if I was a full time film composer, let's say, maybe that would terrify me a little bit because those are I could see, like any other tool, I could see it being abused. I could see AI. There are people who would use it to, um, you know, sort of cut corners and save money, and and you know, I, I can see that, but. Um, it doesn't terrify me yet. Maybe because I'm not seeing the impact right now. Uh, I get that. I'm I'm absolutely terrified because I'm actually, this is an AI voice. Barry recorded me and, <laughs> and he's already put me through AI and he fired me. So this is AI Joe. Um, <laughs> right, right, Barry? I mean, Barry's saving a whole lot of money not having No to comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let me ask you guys. Um, so what what is... Uh, more rewarding for you as a group is it creating the music or is it performing the music oh a hundred percent creating because you know when you want for me going on stage is um the only part i really enjoy is when when i see people having a wonderful experience otherwise for me personally it's uh the, the magic really happens in the studio in that in that creative moment where it's just you and you tap into something and you know you've tapped into something magical and you ride that wave, you know. And I imagine surfers feel that way. You know, I can use so many sort of metaphors to describe that. But um, that's really the magical moment for me. And then stage, it's just, you know, singing the same songs over and over again, and you're just trying to put feeling into it. That that part is less enjoyable. Yeah, when you have to do it over and over again, it's like, bleh, okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I don't know if it's bleh, okay. People, people but... are on their phones. <laughs> Honestly, people are out there on their phones in the crowd and stuff. And it's like, oh. being, on, being on tour is not as glamorous as, as people think. You know, they, they see you for that one and a half hour on stage and you're all dolled up and lights, action, camera, all that. But, you know, the amount of shit work that goes into it before and after is so tiresome, you know, that uh, it can really take a toll on you. I mean, unless you're Taylor Swift. Well, sure, sure. Anybody like a Taylor Swift level or a Beyonce, they're like flying around in jets uh, and they got uh, millions sure. of dollars. And, I'm you know, sure that's she's fun. struggling too over there. She's um, yeah, yeah, I I it's work. Oh, come on. No, see, like, like I the multi Taylor Swift because I actually. I don't care for that music at all, but damn, that girl every night, three and a half hours, she performs. I mean, I, oh, oh my God, that's that is such a long that's, show. That's just oh so insane. I cannot, I cannot imagine three and a half hours every single night. That you I just hand that to her, you know? Yeah, it's. I'm sure it's just as much as hard work for them in a different level. 
Exactly. Yeah, no, it, yeah, exactly. I think for, for you, like, I don't know if touring so much as like a residency somewhere makes more sense for you guys. I yeah, think. that's what we do. Actually, most of our, uh, we've pretty much toured uh, a lot of the top universities in the US, you know, and we do residencies there. So it's anywhere from three days to five days. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. We do workshops and classes and uh and then, you know, it all sort of ends with our performance. So tell me about your website, because I'm looking at it and I'm fascinated you by it. <laughs> you see me looking at it. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, it's like you've got everything here and it's like a great launching place. So you can like, no matter if they know you or not, it's everything's here and it's perfect. And I love it. Well, what what is the website address, Barry? niazmusic.com and i y a z music.com niaz see i'm just self conscious now <laughs> uh, you're now saying it so well i couldn't tell <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> um okay so tell us a little about your music your instrumentalists where did you find the band me are there band members are you doing yeah, this absolutely. no no there is a there are band members uh actually the, it's kind of a very diverse international band we have musicians coming from uh, germany uh we have musicians coming from uh, canada because we lived there for so many years so actually some of the permanent members are still from Montreal. So on stage, we have an electronic musician. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, Azam sings. We have two instrumentalists, which uh, I play a bowed guitar. That's what I do. And I have uh, another uh, called my colleague, Sinan. He plays Kaval. And then we have a tabla player. So there are five musicians on stage. And plus, we will have two dancers along with visuals and you know all that uh, being combined so it wasn't like a craigslist ad you actually like new people <laughs> <laughs> far away from that you know it's actually it's really interesting uh, you know that that's a good side of uh being able to have access to youtube and everything else you know when i whenever i you know somebody wants me they say hey check out this musician maybe it would be good to collaborate with First thing I do, I go on YouTube and look at their videos. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Best on way to audition. <laughs> yeah, you were mentioning before how like technology in the recording industry, like I can only imagine how hard it was to find band members back in the day. You know, it's like, oh hey, I know a great guy. You can go see him. Oh yeah, he lives in San Francisco. So you gotta like drive up, hope that he has a show that night so you can see him play live. Um, YouTube's great for that now. Yeah, isn't that isn't that true? I mean, it really was very different. Now we are, you know, it's so much easier to get a lot of that done. And now, you know, there is this new technology which, yeah, actually I use a lot, which is called audio movers, where you can plug in into your uh, recording session and you can hear your broadcast quality if somebody playing, uh, like, you know. I don't care, Zimbabwe. He can get behind his uh, uh, mic behind his microphone and it's playing, and the, the quality is so good that you actually can kind of get a good assessment of how they do. Oh, what what is that? What is that again? It's called Audio Movers. It's Audio Movers. Okay. Yeah, it's such yeah. a simple plugin. It's very it's a subscription, and when you do it, you actually get a good broadcast quality sound across the internet. Barry, hey, it might make me sound good if we use this. <laughs> Impossible. Yeah. Impossible. Oh, I'm a lost cause. <laughs> well, since since we're on, uh, since we're behind the scenes right now, we can talk about some of this stuff. I'm always fascinated about the merch that bands come up with, and some of them have. It's it's like one of two stories: either like, yeah, we have merch, it's there, and or it's something elaborate somebody's come up with you know can you tell us about your merch and where it comes from well we have our usual stuff which are which are t-shirts and you know the cds and all that but aside from that you know azam is actually an incredible poet and so a lot of times she also kind of frames a lot of her poetry that becomes available to her fans and other you know kind of 
personal items as such that you know she creates and also now we are actually working on the what uh, we are going to call it as azamali design because every picture of her you find on on the web she has this incredible collection of tribal modern jewelries so people were constantly writing to her about it. Now she's uh, launching her own line of jewelry. Oh, congratulations. Excellent. That's awesome. Yes. That's so good. That's so good. Thank you so much. So how did that come about? You're a jeweler. Or how, what is what is the name of a person who makes jewelry? A jeweler? A jeweler. <laughs> I, well, I think I'm more of a designer. It's just trying to earn a living. You know, it's just... <laughs> Yeah, harder and harder to. Man, we we all got our through, hustles, right? <laughs> through music, you know, it's hard to earn a living through music. So it's uh, just kind of trying to be multifaceted and also just still remain artistic, you know. Yeah. So let's talk a little more about the fourth light. Okay. So you've toured this thing already a few times around the world. Um, I'm sure in different places you get different responses, but. Uh, you're going to do it here in L.A. at UCLA's Royce Hall. Uh, and is this your first time performing that? Are you excited? In L.A., this is the first time we're bringing it. Yes. And so, so therefore, we are very excited. I mean, it's uh, it's we're doing this injunction with Farhang Foundation and the UCLA Music Department. So in that sense, you know, we have to build a kind of a, a coalition in order to really be able to implement it. And therefore, it's very exciting. I mean, we are quite uh, happy that we are bringing it to LA. Of all the venues that you've done this at, I know you can do it big and small. What was your favorite venue? I'm sure you're going to say in a country I've never, I can't pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it was in France. We were in the northeast of France and uh, a presenter said, you know, I have access to this church. And you oh, can do this wow. in, inside of a church, and uh, you you know we Jerome uh, flew uh, to the to the space, and what we did is rather than having one projector, he used six. So we kind of in we mapped the entire church, and so you were now inside of a living, moving, visual experience. So everywhere you would turn, there were visuals that are were reacting and were kind of mapped into the space. It oh, was, that sounds fantastic. It was an extraordinary experience. I since then I've been wanting to repeat that, but it's rather very difficult in America because you know so much of it is about liability and insurance and you know uh, it's it makes it so complicated here. Yeah, wow, that is a dream. So wow. Can you imagine? That's cool. Well, Royce Hall isn't that far off, you know what I'm saying? That's a good one, too. Oh, it's an amazing hall. I mean, it's, a, it's an iconic stage, you know. It was between uh, Royce Hall or Ace, as a really, uh, to tell you the truth. But, you know, Royce Hall is by far more accessible. I mean, uh, Ace is gorgeous. I mean, there is no doubt about that. But it was just like, well... You know, still people would ask, where is it? You have to say it's in downtown. But Royce Hall, you know, people know it's part of it. It's been there for over 100 years. I mean, it's, it's an iconic hall. Well, we're excited. Uh, where do you go from there, though? What's next for Niaz? Well, we are working on our developing our next show, which is going to be even bigger and more grand. But, you know, we're trying to kind of use some of the newer technology that has come in the visual world, being able to create avatars and 3D imagery and a lot more. So we're going to continue to push the boundary. And because, you know, that's one thing that Azam and I really get excited about is just creating a more interesting experience both for ourselves and for the audience. I love that. Well, let's create an experience for them now. Let's play a song from Niaz. Can you guys pick one and tell us what it is and what it's about? Yeah, why don't you play the the very first one that is coming up is Sabza Benaz. Actually, that song is very uh, is uh, originally is an Afghan song that we kind of ad adapted and we performed it. It's a folk song from Afghanistan. It's the first song that is on your list right now. I love it. Sabza Banaz. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Very right. 
<laughs> hey, I learned how to say something today, Joe. How I know that? you did. You did good, Barry. You did good. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. And we'd love to have you back with anything you have coming up. Thank you again, Azam Ali and Loga from Niaz. I butchered thank you for it. for having today. us. No, and, you, and just, you actually did it really well. I was I was kind of trembling here. <laughs> oh, no, you guys are fine. I'm just, just kidding. Want... <laughs> no, you you guys did great. Thanks for having us. You're, you're a fun duo. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Just as a reminder, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, August 19th, correct? That's right. At okay, August 19th at Royce Hall at UCLA. Make sure, go get your tickets now at the Royce Hall website. Go now, do it. Go buy some stuff. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.